Hello online everybody, I'm back, Cathy Solange. For people that don't know who I am yet, I do true life crime while doing my makeup and drinking a very very good vino because with friends like you guys, we have to drink and talk and drink and talk and drink and talk. So that's what I do. Oh, and the makeup. So please, if you like my channel and if you like my stories, do the usual, share, comment, recommend my page, like, I appreciate it if you do that because then it means that I should carry on telling my stories. And oh boy, do I have a story today. It's, uh, it is a British serial killer, but not just a serial killer, a truly a nasty, evil, 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 evil little man. He was abusive to all his wives. He, he, he did things just for fun. He loved fighting. He's just not a very nice British person, to be honest. He was known as the bus stop stalker, also known as the bus stop killer. And, to finalise, the hammer man. Because his way to kill women, blonde women, because he had a thing for blonde women, was with a hammer. Okay, you guys ready for this story of evil men? Hope you are. I'll come back without any makeup and I'll start telling the story about Levi Belfield. See you in a bit. Levi Belfield was born from Romanian descended parents. He was born in London on 17th of May 1968. When he was 10 years old, his father unfortunately passed away from leukemia which meant his mother had to bring up him and another three siblings. He ended up being a very big mama's boy. He was so attached that even at the age of 13, she was still wiping his bum and he would sleep on the bed with her. Always. But when I say always, I mean even as an adult, even when he had children himself and had girlfriends, if the mother would come and visit or if he would go and visit the mother, they would sleep in the same bed. Strange? Hmm, just a little. Levi was a very short young boy and so at school, he, uh, apart from being very, very short, he was also quite chubby. He always has this voice that wasn't very manly either. So at school, he got bullied quite a bit. Because of this, when he became an adult, he decided to take this very strict um, muscle pumping classes and going to the gym every day, taking supplements and the most important one was steroids. Now the steroids didn't help him with um, his squeaky voice. It turned, it, it turned even more, you know, <laughs> like this. So he ended, up, he ended up being this big guy, muscly, quite tough, six foot with a very squeaky voice. Anger issues. He already had a little bit of anger issues but uh, it turned to be even worse with the steroids because as well, steroids <gasps> yes oh of course well, i get so excited when i do a mistake i can drink mm. Mm. um where was i yes steroids and um anger issues which didn't help him at but even though he had this squeaky voice and he was only six foot he had a way with the girls apparently he could get any girl or most of the girls that he wanted to, he didn't have any issues getting the girls. He was very popular and it was to do with his charm. He was very, very charming. If he would want something, he could get it. But there was another side to him where he could be really happy and really charming or he could just flip, just like, ah, uh, yes, <laughs> flip, just like that. It didn't help that he, you know, he also thought it was God's gift. He thought that any girl that would be lucky to have him and every girl would want a piece of him because he was so attractive and great and godlike. You can see that I really like this one, don't I? But regardless, with his big ego and his great uh, charm, he actually ended up having a total of 11 children from three different um girls. Now these poor women weren't treated very nicely. At the beginning apparently he was very very romantic and he was full of promises and he loved them and treated them really well and then eventually he turned sour, nasty, horrible, abusive, a piece of dirt really. That's how he would treat them. 
The things they would put his girlfriends at the time through was just unbelievable. Just things like um, make a stand in a stall in the bedroom during the whole night while he slept. She would have to stand there. She couldn't go to the toilet. She couldn't. She she couldn't sit down. If she did, she would be in a lot of trouble. As in, she would get hit quite a lot. So they uh, they were petrified. And apparently he did this to all of them. Um, there was one instance that she was late home and to punish her, he took her to the woods and he sexually assaulted her. Um, sexually assaulting her became also a part of the norm as a punishment for small things they would do. Also, he would cheat on them, he would beat them up, he would control their phone, he would control what they would wear, what can they say what they can say to people. Uh, yeah, they, they, it was a nasty piece of work even to his own uh, girlfriends, the mother of his kids. One of his exes that helped this guy so much, she has told us the way she was treated, uh, giving me all these examples that I'm giving you of what he would do to her and all the other girlfriends. And she said that after, I think it was after four years of being together and after he took her to the woods and he raped her, there was another instance where they were arguing loads and he got so angry with her that he got a t-shirt, I believe, and he just wrapped it around her neck and he was trying to strangle her. One of the kids came into the room and that's when he stopped. After that, she got really, really scared that she was going to die. And with the help of her mother and someone else, I can't remember who, but with the help of other people, she went into a woman's refugee. She was there for a while, but eventually Levi got what he wanted. Using the kids and the power that he had over her, he got her to come back. One of his jobs was also being a security uh, doorman at one of the clubs in town. And what he would do was he would chat up all the young girls and... He would tell them how much they want to have sex with him and how much they, uh, well, how much they want him, basically. And it was successful with some, it's so much that he had a mattress in the back of his van to take the girls there. Or also, there was a sofa upstairs in the club, dirty old sofa, where he would take them. Some people say that... Um, they remember having sex with him, but this, they were so drunk that they just thought, you know, if there's nothing I can say or do. Um, I came upstairs and I was having sex with him. So, in a way, there's a few instances that they might have not have been sober enough or wanting it enough, but he still took it because he's evil. He also then started another job, he got a van and he was clamping cars, which to him it was, like, it was the perfect job because, you know, it, it's a very aggressive job. And he would clamp cars even when he shouldn't. So for example, he would go through the work of putting an ad on the newspaper for a sexual worker. So if anyone would call up and ask for a sex worker, he would say yes, 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 he would give an address. And when they would get there, they would get out of the car to go to the address given by the person that answered the phone to them on the ad. And he would, oh, hello. And he, um, while they're there looking for the, the sex worker who doesn't exist, he would clamp their cars. When they would return and see their cars clamped, they would argue about it, but what can they do? Well, they can't go to the police or anything. On the 21st of March, 2002, Levi and his girlfriend were doing a very good deed and they were babysitting. No, they were not. They were not babysitting. They were house-sitting for one of uh, Levi's girlfriend's friends. When they went into their house or when they were there, Levi decided to join her later and he said he was going to go and get some food and get some drinks. At the same time, a 13-year-old girl called Lily Dowler was walking home through the park and um, went missing. The parents started looking for her and a search started when she didn't come home for a few hours. In the meantime, he gets home to his girlfriend at the time with a box of pizza and some beers for them to enjoy the night together. 
girlfriend said uh, they finished the beers and the pizza he was acting normal and when they went to bed but around three o'clock in the morning he got up and he said i can't sleep I, I'm, I'm just gonna go for a walk i'll take the dog and uh, i'm just gonna go for a walk that's when he went back to his uh, girlfriend's flat now that's where he took Amelia when he went to get food he kidnapped her from the park he took her to his house we don't even know what the cause of death was because unfortunately he dumped her not too far from where they were without any clothes but unfortunately she was only found six months later which meant she was only recognized by her dental work but there was no way to say if she was sexually assaulted and, and how she died that was the start of him he's a healer and killing young girls that was his preference young on february 2003 marshall mcdonald a 19 year old took the 111 kingston upon thames uh, bus home and when she was just 100 meters from her door she was hit three times with what we think it is a hammer now the neighbor heard this thump really loud and at the same time that he heard that he also heard her scream what the neighbor did was he called the police straight away and then he, he made his way outside after calling the police and he found her on the floor with her head open and just bleeding the ambulance got there they took her to the hospital but unfortunately even though the medical team tried everything that they could they were unable to save her so that was his second victim. The police um, didn't connect the dots at the time because it's two completely different deaths. When it comes to his victims, what he would do would, was he would stop them mostly from um, if they were getting a bus. That's why when they started looking for this serial killer, they actually called him the bus stop stalker because that's how he would start. He would start with stalking them, they would get the bus and he would follow that bus and then he would just wait, he would just he'd wait for them to turn up and that's when he would strike. So that was his strategy, that's how he got them. Then the next victim it was on the 28th of May in 2004. Her name is Katie Sheedy, she was 18. She went out with friends to a local pub where they were singing karaoke and she had a few drinks with a friend she did the karaoke and then as per usual she took a bus home she took the bus home uh, she lived in the west area of london and as she got out of the uh, bus she noticed something strange across the road this white car or van that was on but the lights were turned off and she thought mm, there's something really weird here so she crossed to the other side of the road of course levi did not like this not even a bit so what he does is he gets his car he drives and he runs her over and as the car goes over her and she feels her bones cracking she looks back and he's doing it again he ran her over the second time just to make sure that, that she's dead and then he flew he went on with his life i don't know how but katie was actually alive she tried to get up but couldn't and but she managed to get her phone out of her bag and she actually called her mum and an ambulance she managed to make those phone calls and you wouldn't believe it they took her to the hospital and that brave young lady she survived she had a lot of damage done she had a lot of operations she spent a long long time in the hospital but she survived the damage that he did with the car so i'm just going to let you know so you see the amount of pain she was in when she gathered her phone to call her mum and the ambulance the van and the carriage ripped open Katie's back. Her liver was split in two, her collarbone and ribs were broken, and one lung punctured and the other one collapsed. She had all that and in the end she survived. And because of her, when it was time to find him, um, and also in court, she was one of the witnesses. She gave the van or car description. She also picked them up, picked them up, picked him up from a, a row of suspects as well uh, she helped the case a lot but he didn't stop there unfortunately he wasn't happy with just doing that there was this French um, student she was here on her last day her name was Emily Delagrange she was 22 years old 
and on the 19th of August 2004 she got a bus home but she's had a few drinks with a few friends and she missed the stop she fell asleep missed the stop when she woke up she was the bus driver is it far it was a six minute walk so she decided you know I'll walk home it's not that far she was found in Twickenham Green with head injuries again he just got hammers and just hit the girls just for pleasure just for being bullied just for being evil that's what he liked doing so the police was then looking for this hammer man the serial killer the bus stopped uh bus stop killer they didn't know who it was so they started putting things out on the news like the car that was used because now they knew where the car was and they also started putting like the locations of where the girls started to appear dead and his ex-wife was the one that actually called the police and said oh, hello I think it was my husband or sorry my boyfriend I think he's killing these girls and to begin with the police didn't take it serious they just thought another girlfriend that has an issue with the boyfriend and wants to get him to be guilty that's what they thought but then looking into it she showed them these magazines that he had in the garage where he would cut all of the blonde girls heads off the the, uh, the magazines i know i know that's not enough but when it came to millie as well she explained what happened that he got to uh, the house with different clothes and then you know he got rid of the bedding there was a lot of similarities that she gave to the police and the police thought oh okay i think we've got something here and then also she said the abuse that he was giving her like all the rapes and everything that he was doing to her so they decided to well, they put two and two together they then started looking at the two cars that he had before and those two cars were where some of the um, murders happened so they started putting them on surveillance and under surveillance they could see him stopping and talking to young girls as young as 13 because the police then in interrogated those girls and he was saying things like bet you're a virgin of bet you're very tight oh, do you want to come in my van and they didn't but eventually they did get a, an arrest for him and because he was abusing his wife to start with just to get him off the streets they went to his house knocked on the door and the the girlfriend actually lied and said no he's not here and then she said to a police officer really low voice and said he's in the attic he's, he's hiding and that's where they found him they took him to the police station he has denied everything actually no sorry no 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 no. let me start again the only thing he says still until now is no comment no comment no comment he hasn't said anything since so with emma's testimony plus he had his phone in the same location where he killed emily he also the cars were shown as well in the cctv with all that information and his arrest on the 22nd of November 2004 he was convicted of three life sentences with a recommendation to never to never be released good one I'm glad he's off the streets oh also it is believed that he has done other abductions and many many other rapes that people just didn't come forward because they were either too drunk or scared of him at the time when he was taken to jail, he tried to commit suicide straight away using the strings from his trainers, put it around his neck and then put his head in the metal toilets and tried to commit suicide like that. It wasn't successful. He was sent to see if he was mentally okay to be interviewed because of his suicide attempt and it was decided that he was. Also in prison, he now has found Islam as a religion and has changed his name and he would like to be called Yusef Rahim and he asks to be called that. So Levi Belfield. Hope you're having a good stay in prison. So yes, he's away, we're safe, he's good, he hasn't admitted to anything, he's just an evil, bully, horrible, ugly person that is no longer here as a threat to us. Still alive though. <laughs> um right guys i hope you enjoyed this uh, my makeup and i have to thank you again for giving me this time this space to talk to you guys and to drink my uh, vinyl of course mm. truly enjoyed it and i'll be back again in two weeks time don't forget to leave me comments let me know what you think 
and um, thank you again and I'll see you in two weeks time bye bye ciao